Um, quite a cheesy title. Uh, I found this rather nice picture, which might be hard to see at the moment, but I wanted to give it a subtitle. We don't know where God's hiding, but how do we know where to give him the tickle? Or something like that. Um, so this talk is basically going to be along the lines of the, the story I'm going to try and sell you is that statistical information uh, isn't really the same as causal information. And statistical models are really the same thing as causal models. Um, and hard causal information seems to be quite tricky to come by, or at least expensive to gather, it, it, and, and in some contexts, actually difficult, if not impossible. Um, and then the punchline is going to be that if you can't really get all the causal information you want from the world, then possibly there might be some use for the idea of trying to simulate a system where you know the causal structure and see what it produces and see if you can have any connection with something you do know about the world. If you like, experiments conducted in silica. So I'm going to motivate this uh, with an example of some data, and this is some completely made up data, uh, and it's all com utterly bogus, all these things I'm going to talk about, but hopefully they just demonstrate the principle. So what we've got here is uh, on the x-axis, we've got number of police officers attending student demonstration. And on the y-axis, we've got thousands of pounds of da damage caused by the ensuing riot. So, you know, I'll try to be a little bit topical for the last few months um, about demos and things like that. So we're probably all very familiar with this sort of data. Uh, we've got a nice scatter plot. Each point represents, say, a particular um, demonstration that took place and the number of police officers that were in attendance and uh, the amount of damage in thousands of pounds that were caused um, during that riot. Uh, we've got a line of best fit and a confidence interval around it, and it seems like these two things are healthily, positively correlated. Um, so we might think, okay, we're quantitative types. We've got some quantitative data. Let's fit ourselves a statistical model to that. Why don't we? So we've got our dependent variable. We could say what was the cost of the riot. We've got our uh, uh, independent variable, the number of police. We've got some coefficient, b of y regressed on x which we hope will relate the one to the other, and we've got a bit of error left over at the end. We can stuff that into a computer, and, uh, or you know, work it out by hand, uh, and we can get some estimated statistical parameters for that. We uh, particularly might be interested in the parameter here uh, for the B parameter, just the one. We've called it police, or I've called it police in this model, and it comes out with uh, this figure. Now, how do we interpret this figure? Well, in effect, what we've got here is just a, a model of some conditional uh, distribution of the uh, outcome variable, conditional upon the x variable. Uh, and we say that the linkage between uh, the x and the y is this um, beta coefficient. And we could say, right, the damage associated with each, with each additional police officer is £1,294.84. A nice reassuringly bogus amount of uh, precision there. Now, that's excellent. That's a statistical model. We've got a conditional uh, expectation for uh, a value we're interested in. If we were in the actuarial business, then that might be quite good enough for us to try and work out, you know, if we could get some access to knowledge about police deployment, we might know how much we're going to be hit for in terms of damage um, later on. But if we're in the wanting to understand how it all happened and the theory and the policy sort of business about wanting to do something about these things... Um, then we have to go beyond just talking about conditional distributions of variables. We might want to say something about a theory, about why these things happen. We might want to have, uh, you know, say, all oh, right, it seems to be that greater numbers of police provoke the demonstrators into property damage. And so provocation would be part of our theory. Um, or we might be policy people. We might have just been told to make huge swathing cuts to our budgets. And so we think, OK, right, we'll just send no police to the demonstration and that'll save us a good chunk of money, no doubt. Now, these are, are more than just a statistical look at the data. These are causal interpretations. Um, now, I'm very careful during this talk to be aware that there's lots of people who know a lot more about this topic than me going to give you talks about causality later on. So I'm going to make no effort whatsoever to define what I understand to be causality. We'll just see how it goes. But these strike me as... Uh, interpretations that seek to put some sort of ordering on things. They seek to take some things called causes and that those things seem to in some fashion lead to, lead to something else called, called effects. 
And I would argue, uh, and ho hopefully I'm not alone, that there's actually more information in this causal interpretation than there is in just the statistical information that we presented there. Um, so a, a very st simple and straightforward way of thinking about it would be that, okay, well, I could rewrite that statistical model I had earlier where I was looking at y as a function of x, and I could do it in terms of x as a function of y. Um, both of those models would fit the data, statistically speaking, equally well, and there'd be no particular statistical reason for you know, deciding between them. And in general, there'll exist many equivalent causal models that could be associated with the same set of statistical data. Uh, and uh, a, a very good book on this topic, or at least a very con you know, a, uh, an impressive book on this topic that I've read recently, um, would be this uh, a book by Pearl called Causality, funnily enough. And he argues passionately for this distinction between causal information and statistical information. He then does go on to say there's a lot more we can extract about causality from what has perhaps been the tradition in the statistical modelling uh, arena. But he would argue, and I would argue too, for this distinction between the two types of information. So statistical model there, we've got some sense of a symmetry. Whereas if we take these, th those and sort of cast them as causal models, well, then there's definitely not a symmetry between them. They've got different causal accounts. So if we take these square boxes to represent the variables and the directed arrows as regression, uh, well, in this sense, as causal relationships, then we've got, on the one hand, our original model, the police provoke the protesters. X causes Y. But on the other hand, if we reverse it, we've got, actually, Y causes X. Perhaps the amount of damage that's being caused results in more police officers being sent into the riot. Um, obviously, as proper good social, well, and other types of science people, you'll say, well, <laughs> hold on a minute, you know, you're forgetting a rather big factor here. What about the idea uh, that it might be something else that's causing these two things to be related? Um, you're just forgetting completely about a confounder there. Surely, if we were just to measure enough confounders and, and the proper ones, then they would help us to sort of work out what the causal relationships were uh, between the X and the Y. So in this case, we might say, right, there's some unmeasured factor called Z, um, perhaps the size of the demonstration, and that may affect the amount of damage just because there's more people and might be more likely to be people who are going to cause damage in a larger uh, uh, demonstration than a smaller one. And the police might try and send along the number of officers in proportion to the number of people they see need to be controlled. So we've got an alternative causal model now where we've got an unobserved confounder that might be related to both of these things. And we might find we could still retain our causal interpretation of X on Y, and we might find that controlling for demo size, that might flip over this positive uh, correlation. We might now see perhaps a negative relationship, whereby given the size of the demo, the more police officers are, the better they're able to control um, the damage. Now that's all well and good, but I would argue strongly that these extra intuitions and knowing where to look for the uh, confounders and then interpreting the relationships based upon that are based upon, again, more than just the statistical information that were there. Um, even if we had statistical information on confounders, or you know, lots and lots of measured variables, then we could perhaps look for which ones seem to be related to you know, the patterns of, of uh, relationship in the statistical data, and we might think that we could have a statistical understanding of confounding. But uh, Pearl and others would suggest that actually, even then, common causes, things that have got this causal interpretation of you know, resulting in the correlation between these two things, sometimes might be confused for common effects or colliders, as they're called in this type of analysis. Um, and the motivation for that would, uh, well, the, the outcome of that, the consequence, would be that even with something as straightforward as confounding, it seems like there's a little bit more than a statistical interpretation. There seems to be a need for a causal interpretation. This non-symmetrical arrows going this way, not that way. And even then, the you know, if we've got all the confounders we want, they won't necessarily disambiguate the causal direction. Uh, so we could still have a model that would be plausible with y on x at the bottom there, depending upon other factors. That's not to say confounders won't do this, but in some circumstances they won't help us with these sort of causal questions. Um, and especially in social systems, uh, or yeah, the, the more complicated the system and the more interconnected it is, the more likely there are going to be their confounders that you haven't measured and what you're going to do then. And I think probably other speakers are going to give us a, a talk about that later. Um, okay, so what can we do? What's in the toolkit? 
Right, well, okay, we could try and look for... Oh, yeah, sorry, one point uh, I should talk about before moving on. Okay, well, if we can't measure... Con well, if confounders won't always help us out of this trap, won't always provide us with the information we need to justify a causal explanation, perhaps time. That's, yeah, yeah, that seems to be related to this idea of causality. Causes uh, should precede effects, really, to be, uh, you know, to be canonical about this. So surely we just need to collect longitudinal data to be able to disambiguate causality. Uh, well, yes, that's undoubtedly useful, but it's not always going to be sufficient. It's, you know, it's a, a necessary but not a sufficient uh, case to establish causality. As a rather pithy uh, comment or example by Pearl, the idea is that a barometer, the pressure will fall before it rains. It doesn't really mean that the barometer is causing the rain. Again, we've got a hidden confounder there even though we've got some temporal precedence uh, in a relationship. So again, you know, where are we going to find this information that he helps us to justify a causal interpretation and not just a, a statistical one? Okay, well, now we're thought, talking about causes and effects, and that gives us a bit of, lack of uh, some lack of symmetry in this model, then we can start to think about these variables called instruments that af affect the cause, but not directly the effect. Uh, and if we can make some argument and justify the idea that this variable isn't likely to be related to anything that might be confounding these two and, and be independent of these error terms, and if we can find one of those and justify it, then we can perhaps start to get the handle on which one of these directions is um, a plausible one. So, you know, I've, I've made these things up off the top of my head. I've no idea whether they make plausible uh, confounders, uh, sorry, instruments. Um, police budgets, if you've got restricted police budgets they might not be able to send so many police if you've got larger numbers of male protesters young men just tend to be more violent than women as an empirical observation and so perhaps these things uh, might be related to the causes but not perhaps necessarily directly to the effects only through the putative causes so we've got this idea of instruments and they're undoubtedly useful also if you can find them and if you can justify them which is a, a tricky uh, thing to do Almost the perfect instrument would be is if you can conduct a randomised experiment whereby you randomise people to treatments and then intervene in some way based upon that randomisation. So here we've got uh, a randomised treatment on this uh, effect. So we're going to administer some violence-inducing thing. Like let me just give everyone five pints of lager or half of the people randomly assigned to the demos are going to give them five pints of lager, up the uh, violence, and perhaps they'll produce... Uh, yeah, perhaps that'll give us a way to unpick whether or not this is a plausible causal model. Now, randomization, in a sense, almost, well, if it's done perfectly, it will guarantee that the, you know, randomization, there'll be no particular reason why people being allocated to one treatment or not would be related to this outcome in any way other than this pathway that we think we're affecting. So the idea of a perfect randomized inter intervention, you know, will, you know, disambiguate causality. And, you know, there's various philosophical discussions about why that might be. And, you know, it's not a, a done deal. There are further assumptions you have to make. But it, it seems to be the gold standard for establishing causality. But in the real world, not always perfect. People who are randomised to treatments don't always take those treatments. It's not always ethical. Um, dosing people up with lager and encouraging them to riot might not be considered OK by, you know, ethics committees and things like that. Um, and it's not always practical or possible, you know, given the you know, um, current state of technology or the amount of money you've got available um, or the re yeah, resources are often come down to it. It's not always possible to do these ideal randomised interventions. And because they're a, a very precise tool and, and they cost a lot to uh, you know, look at particular causal pathways, they don't, don't seem like a really very efficient use of resources to try to wade your way through perhaps an area where there isn't a lot of uh, very strongly articulated causal theory for you to be able to use these precise instruments to, uh, to have a look at what's going on. So what, what do we do? So all that is preamble to this next bit. What else might there be in the toolkit? Well, there's, there's lots of other things. We're going to hear about some of those things later. What I'm going to talk about is the idea of simulation methods. So... Thus far, I've talked about the idea of causal modelling. We get these, which is a phrase that you know, became current, seems to be dying away a little bit in the uh, statistics literature. This idea of trying to extract causal knowledge 
from a combination of research design and data. But if we can't extract the causal information we're after, then what we could try is to actually model the putative causes that we're interested in. Now, I say simulating known causal systems in this slide. What I mean there is that if I know what the causal structure is, it might not be true of the world, but if I know what the causal structure is in a simulation whereby x leads to y leads to z, then I can set these things going and observe what happens, observe the emergent behaviour in these simulations. I can see if these things have any relationship to the system under study that I'm interested in. I'm going to focus particularly on a very general class of these simulation models called agent-based models. Um, and the idea is that they're, they're bottom-up devices. You specify the micro-behaviour of these little agents in the models um, and the way that they interact and behave. And then you see, upper level, what you could call social structures emergent. Um, these models consist of many little bits of computer code, autonomous uh, little agents in a computer simulation, that each one gets autonomously, uh, gets some autonomy, and gets a set of rules it's trying to follow. They may be adaptive, they might not necessarily follow the same set of rules at one point as uh, in another. They interact with other agents, uh, and they may well, uh, oh, I've said that, may well adapt to their environment. So they go, they're very general, and they encompass a lot more types of model than can be uh, written down, often in solvable uh, statistical ways. The best way to describe them, I think, is to perhaps show you uh, some of these things. So some of the first types of these models were called Boyds, uh, a sort of New York take on birds, I think. Um, uh, so the idea is that these agents, these little computer agents, represent things that flock, herd, or school. Um, now, people have been trying to look at how these creatures might coordinate their behaviour. You see a, a flock of birds flying around. It seems to be a single entity, as though there's some controller deciding what happens in that flock of birds. The intuition uh, for this type of model is that what happens if there's no central controller? What happens if each bird is just trying to follow a couple of very, very simple local rules? So, for instance, each bird might just try and stay close to uh, other birds, uh, but not so close that they collide. And each bird might just try and travel in the general direction that the other birds are trying to travel in, or perhaps away from something they perceive as a threat. So without any central control, you can actually have very simple models like this produce things that qualitatively look like things we observe in the real world. Uh, and these are bottom-up models that in no way is the overall behaviour of the flock encoded um, into that bird. Now here was going to be a nice video of, uh, of this. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll skip through it, but any, uh, yeah, it actually is a nice description. I'll, I'll, have to, I'll just see if it's hiding anywhere that I can't see on the page. No. Okay, there would have been a really nice video of these birds all flying around, and yeah, I'll try and find it later. Um, but I'll go back to the, the idea of the justification. Uh, you get a set of very simple rules that you program to these little agents in the model, and those agents move in ways that seems similar to the ways that real flocking, schooling, whatever uh, animals behave. But the idea is, the idea is not that, oh, therefore, we have proved the rules that cause this behaviour, but what we've done is shown that a very simple set of rules can produce this type of behaviour. So perhaps models of this type might be plausible candidates um, for this sort of thing. Um, next example, Schelling's model of segregation. Quite famous. Um, a, ch a chessboard. What, what I'll do is actually describe it as we're going through. So this is, uh, if you like, a chessboard. Each piece, each uh, square on the board, populated by either an agent of type A, green, type B, red, or blank. Um, each agent has got a preference. This could be taken as like resident residences. Each agent has got a preference here, 30%, for the minimum number of people of their type that they would like to live next to. And if they live le next to fewer than that, they, they're unhappy and they want to move. And so at each time step and it goes through time ticks, each agent will be given the chance to move if they're unhappy. So we start them off randomly so that each person on average lives is, you know, 50% of people of its own type, 50% of people of its other type, and there's about 20% people unhappy. Um, after just four time ticks, then people have moved so that actually people are, there's 70% of people living, 70% of adjacencies are with people of your own type rather than the other type. And after only 10 ticks, it's almost reached asymptote, whereas nearly three-quarters of people are living uh, next to someone uh, 
again, this idea of three quarters of adjacencies are with people of your own type. And we start to see patterns of segregation occur. Um, and that's based around, so 70%, if you like, segregation, based around just a very small 30% individual preference for being you know, with people of your own type. And again, simple rules lead to these rather stark differences uh, that seem to emerge when you allow the whole thing to interact and evolve. Benefits of these models, to be useful as models of the real world, you really need powerful theories to guide your model building. And those are sparse in the social sciences. These are things, when I say powerful models, I mean models that tightly constrain what you expect to see based upon the theory. But they can be useful as models of our theoretical concepts. They, make us, they force us to, to be precise in the way we, we expect micro and macro behaviour to interact. And I would say they can be used as a bridge to connect our theoretical intuitions with imperfect and incomplete observation. Um, and finally, uh, the reason I'm talking about this is because I'm involved in a project that is using these methods. There's some of us social scientists um, who are going to come up with some social theory and some data, give those to some computational modelers in MMU who will construct big, big, complicated things um, like these agent-based models, and then some people in theoretical physics who are going to try and simplify them uh, and make them tractable. And you can find out more there. There's some uh, stuff you might want to find out more about. Um, please do come along and join us when we talk to all, all uh, each other. Computational modelers, physics types and social people and biologists and all sorts on a Friday. Ideal time, obviously. Um, and there's someone if you'd like to find out more about that. Thank you very much.